All right, so I'm going to be making a little video here showing off my rack gear because uh, I've had a lot of people on YouTube who actually want to see more uh, pro audio related videos. So I'm going to show you guys part one of this video because um, I have a lot of rack gear, so I'm probably not going to show all of it in this video. So right here's my main rack. This is the thing I use normally for when I have to do gigs with uh, pretty much mixed between passive and active speaker stuff. And that is my main rack. That thing has a lot of gear in it. It's got a little roadie case, as you can see. Um, not a bad case. I mean, it's a fantastic case. Very lightweight case. Um, just wish the equipment in it was just about as equally as light. Anyhow. Oh, hell. Oh, that's why we don't open that side. I gotta put a label on it that says back and front. All right, so this rack by itself weighs about 245 pounds when it's fully loaded with cables and everything. It's not light, so it makes good use for the cables to be in here, but unfortunately when you're not, you know, when you're moving it, you got to take the cables out. And you got to work smarter, not harder with this stuff. This stuff will kill you if you're dumb with it. I guess we'll start off top to bottom to show you what I got and why it's in here. First off, we've got an RS uh, power distribution thing with these little like pull-out uh, light systems, which basically just use a uh, the, one of those tiny little car bulb things or those little Christmas tree tea whatever bulbs that go in here. And these are pretty cool. These things. This has got a circuit breaker and it's also got a grounding system on it, which doesn't work for shit. Um, but hey, I got it for free, so I can't complain. So yeah, I had to fix that. The uh, actual plug on it was falling apart and the third prong was questionable. And so I ran a new cable on it and it did fix the grounding problem, but there's still some uh, ground out issues with it. I'm not quite sure why. Basically, it's got an EMI, RFA, spike, surge, all that fancy crap. Um, if ET probes home, the thing kicks off. Uh, supposedly its maximum wattage is about 1800 watts, but I've pushed more on it and it hasn't tripped, which is not good, but whatever. I guess maybe it's max, uh, continuous. Maybe that's why. Below that, we've got some equalizers, one of which is a double, a double 15, uh, band EQ, so that there's two channels. Below that one, I've got an ME60, uh, rain EQ. This is not a bad EQ. This is one of the best EQs I own besides those little Altec Lansing ones. Those were pretty acceptable, but this is just beyond phenomenal. Below that, I have a Rain uh, Active Crossover System. That's a three-way Active Crossover. I always run it as a two-way if I do end up running Active Crossover stuff, but that is probably going to be moved into a different case um, along with this as well. I don't know. This is just like an everyday config. When I go to gigs, everything stuffs in the back. You throw this in there, and it works. All right, below that, we've got basically two of the exact same uh, compressors. These were Alesis 3630 compressors. Uh, both of them are identical, uh, which is good because that means I can tune them both the same and expect some more results. That kind of stuff makes all the difference of pro audio, just uh, mirroring what you got already. And below that, we've got a Crown Microtech 1000. These things are old. Uh, this is probably a Class A because of the uh, wattage rating on it. But these are really impressive amplifiers. Don't get me wrong. They're old. They're nasty. They may, you know, hum like a motherfucker. But in reality, these are really nice amps. And they retain their value, surprisingly. And I know a lot of bands will still use these things and massive com uh, racks with them all tied up. Um, they're not efficient at all. Um, it puts out about a thousand watts in bridge, which is not, that's pretty respectable for an amp from the 80s, to be honest with you. But, um, the actual watts it's pulling out of the freaking wall are about 18 and 1900 watts or, or something ridiculously high. All I know is that when I kick the thing on, the lights flicker really badly until it all, you know, all the capacitors fill up and it's ready to go. The only problem with these amps is a lot of them are... The older ones like this are two prongs instead of the third. 
and they ground out really badly. I mean, it's almost atrociously bad. So I actually have to put a third prong in this. Um, a lot of my amplifiers that use the two prongs, I've converted them to three. Uh, although I may not even have to because I put a, uh, an actual ground screw up there. I could just probably ground it to the case up to there. I could just ground them all. Uh, or maybe not. That might be a dumb idea. So yeah. So here's how I had this all hooked up. Because I know a lot of people are going to be asking, well, how does this abomination works? The top mixer goes directly, once it, the input goes into here, it goes over to this compressor down here, or this compressor down here. This compressor is obviously a dual channel. Say that you're running them in stereo, you should be able to link them using the stereo link. And this compressor just feeds out. It does not normally run towards anything. It's just a separate system that I use for active speakers like my QSCs that you can see right over here. Now, the one below it, the Rain ME60, this is where it gets really complicated because it varies on what I'm doing per setups. Let's we'll just go over scenario one, which is the basic scenario. I'm running a stereo slash dual mono uh, feed. We're just running a standard full, uh, full band uh, feed from, you know, two speakers in stereo. So what happens is, is it does the same thing that the top one does except... You go through this, bypasses this, it'll be unhooked, and then it'll go directly into the compressor, which then feeds the dual stereo inputs to the amp, and that goes to the, pa the powered speakers, or the passive speakers. Now, scenario two is when I do complicated shit, and I really need the extra tuning benefits. Uh, I've done some really complex setups, but uh, the most basic scenario of number two would be, um, we got to go ahead and take our feeds in here, and with a double crossover. Basically, I'm just running a high and a low, and there's a cutoff. How that works is I normally don't use the bottom channel. I just use the top equalization. Normally, I bypass it depending on what I'm actually tuning up, but we'll just use the top piece here. Goes into here. This can do stereo, but I don't normally bother with it because remember, I only have two channels on this amp if I'm doing a basic scenario. So this amp is normally directly given the ability to just one's bass, one's treble, just run them through in a split active crossover. I can demonstrate this in another video. This is some complicated level audio tech shit, and I think some people might be fascinated by it. So if you guys want to see that kind of a video, give me a thumbs up. Anyhow, so let's describe level uh, scenario two at its most complicated form. This is where shit gets really freaking weird. So... And scenario two, where we really want to run stuff in some weird-ass configurations, here's what you got to do. You take both of the feeds in stereo, you pair them up as close to each other as possible using Unity. You keep these things down. We don't touch these cuts because there's no reason to. This is the built-in you know, cut system. You don't want to touch that. So then here's what we do then. We take both channel A and B out of this thing, and we just shove it into here. And this does do... It does do stereo, but I don't know how well, to be honest with you. And our stereo inputs come out of there, and we allocate the low to the crown. The crown gets the shit, because the crown is the shit. And it can punch shit like you could never believe. These amps are very, very robust and just... You can beat on these things mercilessly. It's kind of like the, C, uh, the PVCS series, like the older 70s and 80s CS amps were the same way. You really can push them hard before stuff really breaks. And the thing is, most modern amplifiers, they may say 1,000 watts, but in reality, the Class D architecture that they build them on, they can't run at 1,000 watts continuously because one scenario, they can overheat. Two, they can basically just flat out blow up and they have to clip themselves otherwise they just can't push that power out that long they're incapable to they don't have the stamina for it where these old class a crown microtechs they don't care hell they make any speaker their bitch they push it and more than likely you're gonna blow up the speaker before you blow up the amp if they break they're very easy to repair this is one of the beloved crown amps like QSC also made a couple amps similar to this in the 70s and 80s that people loved because they were so easy to repair. Uh, a lot of bands, again, professional bands such as like Journey and shit, they use these all the time because they just don't die. And when they do, they have the know-how to fix them themselves in the tour bus. 
So, they're pretty respectable. Anyhow, um, the Crown gets the heavy load. It always gets the heavy load. It can handle it. I have other amps that can handle it, but not like the Crown. The Crown can push a 1,000 in full bridge. So we run this in dual, uh, in a single mono bridge, and this is what's handling the subs, because the subs, no matter what, run in mono on here. There's no reason to bother. So then we got to get the second amp rack out, which I don't not, I don't think I really have a second amp rack uh, assembled, but I had one, uh, I think it was a 3U amp rack that had two PVCS 200s in it, and that would run uh, in bridge. If you really wanted to do a tri mono or a tri crossover system where you've got highs, mids, and lows, you run the CS200 in uh, stereo. So one half does uh, stereo right and left does high, stereo right and left does low, and the second amp. So first amp runs highs, for second amp runs lows. I've done stuff like that. It's not even worth the actual stereo aspect. It's dumb. Don't do it. You know, most uh, internal crossovers and speakers have more than enough capability to handle themselves. If you really do find that you need uh, an active crossover system, that's fine. Just don't go overkill. It Sometimes it'll bite you in the ass, especially when you're EQing, which is why these come in handy. If, God forbid, feedback comes through, you can find the feedback frequency. I've always noticed in uh, open areas that it's normally around, for, for the microphones that I use, 10 and 8 uh, kilohertz will do it. And you just pull these guys back and the back feed goes away. It's just a godsend. But in most cases, I don't even use the crossover, so um, I might just move it out of here. Along with one of the compressors, I just gonna want to maybe get a, a proper rack that is just has enough to run the crown um, and I'm probably going to make a custom rack for a lot of my Altec Lansing amps because I have some older class uh, B Altec Lansings. I've got to make a video of me repairing one. I blew it up in another gig, so yeah, there it is. It's a lot. If you want a better video on this, I can probably try. It's just a lot of crazy shit going on in this thing. But to have fill it up, basically, it's it works, and uh, this is the main amp rack, or the main rack that I use at gigs almost all the time. Even if I don't have uh, pa act, uh, passive speakers, I, I gotta get something where I don't have to carry this. I just carry one rack, basic gear, maybe a compressor, and a uh, crossover, and that's it. That way I don't have to carry all this godforsaken shit everywhere, because uh, it, it can get heavy. Uh, again, with all the cables, uh, at least the cables I took out that fell out earlier in this thing, it gets to about 250 pounds. Right now, it's probably a good 200 pounds. I mean, I can lift it, but prolonged lifting this is, is not nice, and it drains you physically. So, I normally just keep it in the car. You know, I really don't have to come back to this. It just sits there. If I have to adjust the compression and stuff, fine, I'll walk over there. But this just sits in the trunk or the, the back seat, and I just run everything out to the to the mixer through an XLR. That's all I need to do. Or a quarter inch. Oh yeah, and just so I don't have to go to the back of this thing and explain it further, this is running to quarter inches. There's no speak-ons. I don't have speak-on gear. I know I'm a scrub like that. I'm sorry. I have quarter inch shit. And uh, I don't I don't mind quarter inches. It's just there are some issues you're gonna find with quarter inches, especially if you have low impedance cables. By the way, this whole system uh, only works with high impedance cables. So if you run anything with those cheap Radio Shack cables, it's not going to work well at all. You, once you plug in the high impedance cables, boom, it comes to life. But uh, low impedance will actually kill the system, and, and such a it'll neuter it, and probably the saddest way going. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. Comment, rate, subscribe. This is the main rack. I know a lot of people wanted to see it, so there you go. Thank you for watching. Bye.